cruel death. He's gonna go to hell and that's where he belongs. But then the emo- Alright, you know, I know who, I know what, I know when, I know where. To forgive you for what you did. It didn't happen overnight, forgiveness- Harm that I can do. I believe that only the Lord Jesus Christ can save me from my sins. Families, the Russell family, another 220,000. She will have to serve a minimum of four years. Number 15, Gary Ridgway. Gary Leon Ridgway is perhaps a name synonymous with serial slaying. Born on February 18, 1949 in Salt Lake City, Utah, Gary became the second most prolific serial slayer in U.S. history with 49 convictions against him. Known as the Green River Slayer, he targeted teenage girls, young women, body workers, and other women in vulnerable positions, physically attacking them and then strangling them. Ridgway's troubled behavior started in his late teens and he reportedly knifed a six-year-old after leading him into the woods at just 16. Soon after graduating high school, Ridgway signed up for the U.S. Armed Forces and was sent abroad where he continued showing signs of troubled behavior. Described as having an insatiable physical appetite, he frequently engaged in intercourse with body workers even while married. He was married twice, but both marriages fell apart due to infidelity. It was due to his second marriage that Ridgway became religious, leading to him decrying the presence of body workers in their neighborhood. In your words, you said that they didn't mean anything to you, but she meant everything to us. For the death of Wendy Lee Caulfield. Guilty. How do you plead to the charge? You've made it difficult to live up to victims. I know he will burn in hell because you can't be God. He also grew to despise them when he contracted gonorrhea, yet he continued to take advantage of their services. Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Ridgway is believed to have slayed at least 71 teenage girls and women. The bodies were often left in clusters, sometimes posed, usually nude. Ridgway was arrested in 1982 on charges related to body work and became a suspect in the Green River slayings. Hair and saliva samples in 1987 helped the police connect him to the slayings, leading to his arrest. Ridgway pled guilty to the charges in 2003 and cut a deal to avoid the capital penalty in exchange for helping recover all the bodies. In his confession, he acknowledged that he targeted prostitutes because they were quote-unquote easy to pick up and that he hated most of them. He was sentenced to life imprisonment in solitary confinement in a maximum security prison. Throughout the trial, Ridgway seemed to show no remorse for his actions and harbored the same hatred towards body workers. Uh, uh, things killing, killing animals. Okay. Killing animals. Um, Tell me about that. Um, rocks at windows at school, Not interested but, in that. But that's what I took my eye. Number 14, Nico Jenkins. Nico Allen Jenkins began his criminal career at a very early age. He was involved in a carjacking at 15 and was charged with bringing a gun to school at 17. He was sentenced to prison for the carjacking and 18 years for attacks committed in prison. He was, however, released after only serving 10 and a half years. Within a month of being released, Jenkins went on a slaying spree. He was arrested for committing four slayings. When questioned about his motives, he eerily replied that he had carried them out at the behest of the ancient serpent god Apophis. Though this raised some concern about his mental facilities, he was evaluated and declared fully competent. He was made to stand trial where he pled guilty to all four counts of slaying. To the four murders by the defendant. It is therefore the sentence of this court as follows. At case class one felony, death. Count two, use of a deadly weapon, firearm to commit executive to all murder convictions at counts one, four, seven, and 10. Count three, CR 13-2768. Count one, murder in the first degree, a class four to 50 years to run consecutive to all murder convictions at counts one, four, seven, in handwritten letters dated November 3, 2013, submitted to the Omaha World Herald, prosecutors and a judge, Jenkins said he wished to plead guilty to all counts in the four slayings and that he would protect Apophis's kingdom with, quote, animalistic, savage brutality. 
He also attempted to sue the state of Nebraska, claiming the slaying was their fault for wrongfully releasing him from prison earlier. If you don't tell me what the heck happened out there, people are going to think the absolute worst. Everyone went bad. If this someone panicked, if this did something really stupid, now's the time. Because otherwise, you're... I got Nico Jenkins. I got you. What do you mean, sir? I got the weapon. I got Nico Jenkins. I, I will testify to that. This is the first time that I've ever even assisted law enforcement in my life. Just, it's golden. Any jury's not going to look at me and say, oh, he's told before and he's done. With my history, that woman's husband and children, that woman's husband is grieving like a killer that just wanted to go to trouble. I'm documented psychiatrically dis- Throughout the trial, Jenkins maintained that he acted under the command of Apophis. His courtroom antics included speaking in tongues, howling, and laughing as prosecutors recounted the details of his victim's passings. Though a psychiatrist examined him, the medical professional found that while Jenkins did have antisocial personality disorder, he was faking the psychotic symptoms. A three-judge tribunal sentenced him to the capital penalty for his crimes. The U.S. Supreme Court rejected his attempt to sue the state of Nebraska and his request for an appeal. Number 13. Martez Abram Most of us would react badly to losing a job, but this Walmart employee took things to the extreme level when he was laid off in July of 2019. Martez Abram worked in South Haven Walmart, a position he described was his life. On the fateful day in question, Abram got into a fight with another employee and was called to the manager's room, where they proceeded to fire him from the job. Later that day, Abram drove up to the employee and his superior, opening fire on them with his AK and slaying both. When cops arrived, he attacked an officer with his gun, who survived the ordeal, and then tried to set fire to that Walmart. Crime which drew national attention. Now, this is Martez Abram walking into the Shelby County courtroom this morning. When Abram's court proceedings in DeSoto County, Mississippi will begin, this afternoon we're scheduled to speak with the... That's you, isn't it, sir? Yes. Look at it, please, sir. Yes. All right, proceed. Yes. Lines on the floor. Yes. Did the jury reach a unanimous verdict on each of the three counts? All right, if you'll pass the note. Yes. We, the jury, find the defendant, Martez Terrell Abram, guilty of- Backup soon arrived on the scene, managing to subdue Abram, and he was taken in. On the day he was found guilty, Abram stood before a jury and took responsibility for his actions on that fateful day. After being shown security footage of himself attacking the other employee with a weapon, Abram appeared unnerved, admitted to slaying the two employees. The jury found Abram guilty of two counts of slaying and one count of attempted slaying just hours after he had taken the stand. The jury then sentenced Abram to capital punishment for his acts, and Abram's reaction to the hearing shocked everyone in the court. He immediately clasped his head with both hands and appeared to be sobbing. This later led to a complete breakdown on the stand as he seemed to realize the enormity of what he had done and the consequences for him. Though the sentence seemed too harsh for the crimes, the district attorney defended it, stating, Young man that I know, and he truly loved his family. On July the 30th, 2019, she had cost you your life. God will forgive you of your sins. And he is the only one that can save your soul. We were able to forgive you for what you've done. Much better surrounded by family and being treated at DeSoto Baptist. We also learned today that within the last... ...into this, unfortunately, it's sad, uh, but it just shows how important the training is. The police chief today saying that active shooting training likely saved the lives of others. I certainly don't relish in the fact that someone is going to lose their life. However, this case was the most egregious case I've ever seen as far as the methodological approach that was taken to the slaying. He also highlighted that though Abram had cried after hearing the verdict, he had never once apologized for his actions or shown any remorse. Now to the latest on that deadly shooting at a Walmart in Mississippi this morning. You to look into a fire that they say this accused gunman set. The accused gunman was shot. You know, and uh, 
Uh, just uh, about 30 seconds later, we see two people run in the store. Two of our officers encountered the suspect outs outside on the west side park out two weeks ago and they tell us this morning Michael that they firmly believe that that training helped them he will be transferred from the Shelby County Jail where he had been treated after being shot by South Haven police number 12 Joseph James D'Angelo Jr. from 1974 to 1976 the Golden State Slayer was a serial slayer who terrorized residents across California and Joseph James D'Angelo almost got away with it all the notorious mass slayer evaded cops for four decades, always managing to slip away. He was a Navy veteran who committed at least 13 slayings, 51 physical attacks on women, and 120 burglaries. However, his most shocking statistic is that he was also an ex-cop. This was perhaps a reason he could evade the authorities for so long. He was ultimately arrested after newly developed forensic methods were applied. Based on DNA evidence, investigators were also able to identify members of the D'Angelo family as possible suspects, and it was a short leap from there to Joseph's arrest in 2018. He was charged with 12 counts of slaying. D'Angelo confessed after his arrest that he cryptically referred to an inner personality named Jerry, who had forced him to commit the wave of crimes that ended abruptly in 1986. Each one of them. Really sorry to everyone ever. Quite certain that uh, no one else in the family knew either. D'Angelo and his wife had been separated for 20 years. She filed for divorce two years ago. To be engaged to him ever is uh, a regret I'll always have. Bonnie broke off the engagement when she found out how scary D'Angelo could be. He did not take the rejection. Now, finally be held accountable for his actions. My dad lay at the front door. According to Sacramento County Prosecutor Theon Ho, D'Angelo said the following to himself while alone in police interrogation room after his arrest in April 2018. Quote, I didn't have the strength to push him out. He made me. He went with me. It was like in my head. I mean, he's a part of me. I didn't want to do these things. I pushed Jerry out and had a happy life. I did all of those things. I destroyed all their lives. So now I've got to pay the price." Unquote. On June 29th, as part of a plea bargain to avoid the capital penalty, D'Angelo pleaded guilty to 13 counts of first-degree slaying and 13 counts of kidnapping. He received multiple consecutive life sentences without the possibility of parole. D'Angelo offered a brief apology after listening to days of pre-sentencing victim impact statements. Quote, I've listened to all your statements, each of them, and I'm truly sorry to everyone I've hurt and has affected so many people, prosecutors had to find a room large enough to safely hold today's... Angelo, is he a feeble, old, 74-year-old man, a person who has no respect for the rights of other human beings, no respect for the law, remorse. He is a person who lacks a conscience or a soul, who lies, deceives, and manipulates others for no other reason. Sentences. Additional time for weapon enhancements will be imposed as mandated by law. Do you understand that as well? Joaquin County, Stanislaus County, Contra Costa County, Alameda County, and as well as victim impact statement at judgment and sentencing without limitation as to time and without limitation. Number 11, Jeffrey Dahmer. Perhaps the most well-known occupant of this list, Jeffrey Dahmer was an American serial slayer and exploiter known as the Milwaukee Cannibal. Dahmer physically attacked, wasted, and dismembered at least 17 men and boys in Milwaukee, Wisconsin between 1978 and 1991, shocking the world with the extent of his crimes, including cannibalism and necrophilia. Dahmer committed his first slaying in 1978, just three weeks after he graduated from high school, when he picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks and lured him back to his house. When Hicks attempted to leave, Dahmer bludgeoned Hicks with a 10-pound dumbbell before strangling him. In November 1987, Dahmer slayed again when he drugged a man named Stephen Tuomi and seemingly attacked him during a blackout. Following the slaying of Tuomi, Dahmer began actively seeking victims to seduce and attack. By 1991, he had slayed 17 men and boys. In July 1991, Dahmer approached three men, offering them money to pose for nude photographs. 
A man named Tracy Edwards agreed and followed Dahmer back to his apartment, where Dahmer handcuffed him and held a knife to his chest, telling Edwards he intended to eat his heart. I say that because I think I owe it to my profession, having heard all the testimony that I particular situation is concerned, it never became necessary for me specifically to rule. That I did what I did not for reasons of hate. I hated no one. I knew it caused. I tried to do the best I could after the arrest to make amends, but no matter. I've talked to Mr. Boyle about other things that might help ease my conscience in some way for a number of reasons. One of the reasons was to let the world know that these were not hate crimes. I wanted to find out just what it was that caused me to be so bad and evil. But most of all, Mr. Boyle... ...just to man manipulate people. I don't think there's any question about it. Edwards eventually escaped by punching Dahmer and knocking him to the ground, allowing him to run through the unlocked front door. He could flag down two Milwaukee police officers he led back to Dahmer's apartment. The cops overpowered and arrested Dahmer, who immediately confessed to all his crimes but tried to plead insanity. By pleading insanity, Dahmer had the burden to prove to the jurors that he was insane at the time of the slayings. He was ultimately unsuccessful in doing so. His trial began on January 30, 1992, and closing arguments were given on February 14, 1992. The following day, Dahmer was ruled to be sane and not suffering from a mental disorder at the time of each of the slayings. He was convicted and sentenced to 16 consecutive life sentences in prison. Uh, I was saving body parts, such as uh, skulls. Uh, I wish I could say that uh, it just left completely, but uh, no fall asleep, and uh, that's when they would be strangled. Number 10, Steven Lorenzo. A pair of slangs struck fear in the LGBTQ community and horrified the Tampa Bay area almost 20 years ago. But that ugly chapter in Tampa's history has finally closed. Lorenzo was accused, along with Scott Schwecker, of harming and slaying two gay men in 2003. During a sentencing hearing, Schwecker testified that he and Lorenzo drug, exploited, and slayed Gale House and Wachelitz and disposed of their bodies. Wachelitz's body was found in his vehicle in an apartment complex parking lot. He's close to wrapping up after one of the lead suspects, Steven Lorenzo, changes his plea to guilty and wait. That murdered your friend and, and how he did it and how cold and, and calculated will probably give me more closure. The sentencing phase in this trial will start in February and is expected to last. Uh, at every important stage of the proceedings that I reoffer you, attorney and he is sitting right next to you would you like for me to appoint mr gonzalez to rep then uh representing yourself pro se ready to proceed this morning yes most definitely gail house's body was never recovered according to schwickert gail house was dismembered and thrown into various dumpsters after two decades of fighting the charges as his attorney lorenzo changed his plea to guilty and asked for the capital sentence in court, he said the row would be more comfortable and private than federal prison. Though the judge was initially hesitant to give in to Lorenzo's wishes, the mothers of the victims also demanded that he be sentenced to the end row, which later came to be. The judge said Lorenzo's want to be executed had nothing to do with his decision. He told Lorenzo that this, quote, is the punishment you deserve for these horrific crimes, unquote. Lorenzo seemed unplussed about the sentence, stating that he welcomed the capital penalty. The sooner I get euthanized, the faster I can fetch myself a new body and come back again. That's how I look at it, Lorenzo said. Very accurate. Thank yes, you. very much so. <clears throat> They've got all the, the basics in there. I was there, decisions were made, things happened. Um, um, and But I it was in my house. We made that decision. I made that decision. It begs the question that I have, and that is why? Why? speaking with Mr. Uh, um, Gale House at the bar, and that's true. I didn't actually meet Mr. Gale House. Okay, let's all go back to my house and we'll party and have a good time. Mr. Schweik, uh, Mr. Um, and we too. Mr. Gale House agreed to want to do a, a I don't want to tarnish the man, uh, scared the heck out of the other guy. But anyway, he lost control. The kids started to scream. And homeowner, I stayed in the front with one of the other guys. 
And if anybody came along, I, I could say I'm having work done in my life. Number nine, Adam Matos. A Florida man was found guilty of shooting his ex-girlfriend in front of their young son before slaying her parents and new boyfriend in 2014. Adam Matos, 32, of Hudson, was convicted of this brutal quadruple slaying that shocked the country. The body of his ex-girlfriend, Megan Brown, 27, was found passed away on top of a hill in Pasco County, alongside her parents, Margaret and Greg Brown, both 52, and her new boyfriend, Nicholas Leonard, 37. Cop says he shot his ex-girlfriend fatally and her father at their home before he battered Brown's mother and new boyfriend fatally with a hammer. Matos was arrested on September 5, 2014, at a Tampa Bay Area hotel with his missing son, Ismael Tristan Sante Espastan. We the jury unanimously find that the aggravating factors are sufficient to warrant the possible sentence of death. Is this all a big misunderstanding? I don't have anything to say right now. Well, Why'd you do this? What, what you know happened? What for happened you? with the family? I don't have anything to say right now. Jury verdict for count one. We the jury finds as follows as to Adam Matos in this case. What about are you? What about your son? What are your concerns about him right now? I love my son and I hope that he's safe right now. The first degree murder was especially heinous, atrocious, or cruel. Yes. No, our vote to impose a sentence of death is 2 to 10. Dated this 21st day of November 2017. The suspect sat emotionless in court as the verdict was read while the victim's family erupted into sobs. Matos had denied slaying his ex and her family as well as her new partner and refuted a police report that stated he had threatened Megan Brown with a knife on August 28th, the last day anyone had heard from her. He explained what happened, claiming a woman was stalking Brown and sending her threatening letters. But the 32-year-old stunned the court by dramatically confessing from the witness stand. He said a combination of self-defense and paranoia drove him to slay his ex's family, and he left his four-year-old son, who has autism, alone at the scene when he went to buy a shovel to bury the bodies. The jury found him guilty on all charges, but he was not sentenced to the end, bro a feat which meant that at least one juror showed him sympathy, something the judge was quick to point out he did not deserve. Instead, Matos was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. He tried to apologize for his actions at the end of the sentence hearing but was shouted down by his ex-girlfriend's older brother. Would have decided that death was appropriate. This is probably it, but that's their decision. But I also agree with the victims in this case. This was the most selfish that you did all this for your son is ridiculous. Your son was in and then waited five hours by your own admission to walk downstairs with his dead mother, his dead grandfather, and a man who Dave Neal stated, is there any um, costs associated that you're asking me to impose? Number eight, Lori Vallow. Lori Vallow Daybell, the quote-unquote doomsday mom, was a simple woman who shocked the world with her heartless behavior in 2019. Vallow had a daughter, Tylee Ryan, from a previous relationship when she married Charles Vallow, her fourth husband, in 2006. In 2012, the two adopted then two-year-old Joshua. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell met in 2018. The Vallows separated the following year with Charles Vallow filing for device. He said in the divorce filing that his wife had threatened to slay him. Chad Daybell and Lori Vallow married in Hawaii two weeks later on November 5, 2019. JJ Vallow's biological grandparents, Kay and Larry Woodcock, said that they last spoke to the seven-year-old in August and had alerted the police about their disappearance. By December, police and the FBI were searching for 16-year-old Ty Lee and seven-year-old JJ. The search continued into 2020 when police executed a search warrant on Daybell's property in Rexburg, Idaho. There, human remains were found later identified as JJ and Ty Lee, his duct taped and in red pajamas and hers badly burned. Lori Vallow Daybell and Chad Daybell were charged with causing the children's demise. While Daybell could face the capital penalty, the judge ruled Vallow Daybell could not face capital punishment. If that's how this is going to keep going, maybe we have a jury fairly quickly than, than what I assumed. Well, uh, locally, just getting here last night, who said, oh, why are you in, in Boise? I said, with Lori Vallow trial. Right now, she's dressed in a black top, and um, 
She's got her glasses on and looks studious sitting. All the pieces, kind of like all of us, we have a good foundation. We have some of the puzzle put together, but there's a fair check. It's just the, their, their inability to get in touch with Lori or JJ or to even be able to see him on Facebook. Lori Vallow and Chad Daybell, the pair members of an alleged doomsday cult facing first degree year old son. Today in court, Vallow's demeanor had some people raising eyebrows. The accused killer. Gene, good to be with you always. Look, the bottom line is that number one, with respect to the attorneys, the one important. Lori Vallow, not just her demeanor, but she was found to be competent to stand. It was, you know, streamed live, but they were not there. Both pleaded not guilty to all charges. During the proceedings, several details came to light, making the crime even more gruesome. Vallow Daybell, friends said, was increasingly convinced that Doomsday was around the corner. Part of that belief was that people's bodies, including JJ, Tylee, and Charles Vallow, were possessed by evil spirits, turning them into zombies. Throughout the trial, Lori Vallow maintained a very jovial attitude and was caught smiling and giggling several times. The court sentenced her to life in prison without parole. And then, so, you can start what makes the most sense to you and we'll just work her. Well, so we moved into this house three weeks ago because he offered to get me a house here where all my family owns in. And so we adopted him as a baby and so we've been raising him together. And he travels all, doesn't want a divorce, but I don't like him and don't want to deal with him. So that's just how it is. Like, yeah. So we made, all of a sudden, I'm not, I want to see JJ. And I told him, I said, I will never keep JJ from you. Mm -hmm. You can come see you whenever you want to. Come take started. He was screaming and he was super upset and whatever and um Number 7. Banny Duarte A San Clemente woman was arrested in 2018 for her role in a DUI crash in Huntington Beach that slayed three teens from Las Vegas while they were on spring break. She was driving at high speeds on the Pacific Coast Highway when she rear-ended another car that was stopped at a red light and pushed it into a pole. The teens' vehicle erupted in flames, leaving all three deceased at the scene. A fourth person in the car suffered lifelong injuries. The 29-year-old had four times the legal alcohol limit in her system. Quote, If you drink and drive and slay, you will be, if we can prove it, charged with slaying, said Orange County District Attorney Todd Spitzer. Received a tip, that's what they're saying, that this suspect, Bonnie Duarte, might be making plans to leave after this accident a month ago. She was walking free, and then they say they got this tip. So yes, along with Huntington Beach, so that she would be in court today and that we can secure her appearance. The case is about is we have four young teens who are out here from one who readily admits to having driven drunk in the past. One who readily identifies that the only difference the hard truth of the matter is that Mr. Jules and Mr. Martin did the 17 and 18 year olds who were set to graduate from high school later that year were identified by family members and friends as Brooke Howley, Dylan Mack, and AJ Rosie. In court, the victim's family shed memories as photos of their lost loved ones were projected on a screen. It's been the hardest thing we've ever had to do, obviously. Thank God the judge was in our favor and did the right thing because she ended three beautiful babies' lives, said Allie Rossi, the sister of one of the victims. Duarte addressed those in the courtroom during the sentencing hearing and asked for mercy. Quote, I am begging for an opportunity to be able to see my kids again. At this point, I don't even know who's going to raise my children or if I'm ever going to be able to hug them again or comfort them, she said tearfully. No one is to blame but me. I take full responsibility, unquote. Just before handing down the sentence, the judge pointed out that it was not Duarte's first run-in with the law because of drunk driving. She had one prior DUI arrest that did not lead to a conviction. Banny was sentenced to 51 years in prison without the possibility of parole. We're finally able to look this woman in the eye and tell her that her decision devastated their life. I didn't think further into the consequences. I just want to say that I'm now as stringent as the sentence is. One mom said after court today that she would give anything to trade. 19 year old daughter, they got a life sentence. So I think she deserves a life sentence. Number six, Dexter Johnson. Dexter Johnson was a high school dropout with schizophrenia who was arrested for a carjacking in 2016. According to testimony, Johnson and four accomplices came across the young couple sitting in Aparesi's Toyota as they chatted outside Nyo's home. Johnson and two others threatened them with a pistol and a shotgun. 
Then, three attackers drove the pair around Houston in a Parisi's car, stealing her cash and credit cards, and trying to get money from her bank accounts. Behind them, two other accomplices followed in their vehicle. Eventually, the violent crew pulled over and, according to trial testimony, Johnson physically attacked a Parisi in the back seat. Her boyfriend was forced to listen to it on his knees as the other attackers taunted him. Then, Johnson used his weapon to hit Ngo in the head before slaying a Parisi. At trial, Johnson's defense team argued that someone else walked the couple into the woods and fired the fatal shot. Dexter Darnell Johnson, the jury has found you guilty of cap. Ladies and gentlemen, the jury is going to complete your jury service. I'm going to meet you in the jury. During the sentencing, Dexter appeared pensive and remained seated on his chair, but his mother started wailing in court. Then suddenly, Johnson sprang from his seat, knocking over a computer monitor in the process, leaping towards the victim's family. The courtroom erupted into pandemonium as the bailiffs all storm and tackle Johnson. Johnson was sentenced to the ending row after the case, but after several appeals, another judge ordered a stay. Johnson complained about his attorney and was granted another one. The second attorney was tasked with figuring out whether the work of the previous attorney was up to par, but shockingly reported back claiming that the other attorney had, quote, violated ethical and professional duties throughout his representation, unquote, according to court records. Johnson's fate is undecided, but prosecutors say his reckoning is coming. Number 5. Lewis Matthews a Tampa man who physically exploited a 10-year-old girl and poured bleach on her genitals and clothes to try to destroy evidence of the crime will spend the rest of his life in prison. Circuit Court Judge Kimberly Fernandez sentenced Lewis Matthews, 43, to the mandatory minimum sentence of life in prison for physical battery on a victim younger than 12. 25 years each on two counts of lewd or lascivious exploitation of a victim younger than 12, and five years for tampering with evidence. Matthews was found guilty and prosecutor said Matthew, who had been dating the victim's mother for several years, was at her house. I'll stipulate that he was on probation at the time that this alleged... Is there anything that you wish to say? No, ma'am. I thank you for your time and everything. Matthews was also on probation for another crime when he committed the child abuse. He approached the child as she slept and physically exploited her. The child's mother heard a noise and came downstairs. Stunned by what she discovered, the child's mother called 911. As the victim's mother was on the phone, Matthews took the young child and the two other children in the home and drove away with them. Matthews stopped at a nearby gas station and brought the girl inside the store. He directed her to go into the bathroom. Matthews then went down the aisle, picked up a bottle of bleach, and joined the victim in the bathroom. Inside the bathroom, Matthews ordered the victim to remove her pants and underwear. He then splashed caustic bleach onto her genitals. Matthews took the victim's underwear and threw them into a dumpster behind the store. Despite his attempts to destroy evidence, investigators were still able to detect Matthews' DNA on the bleach-stained underwear, as well as the victim's body and other clothing. Quote, parents who are exploiting kids in their custody, it makes your blood boil, unquote. Andrew Warren, state attorney for the 13th Judicial Circuit, was quoted as saying in a news release, that's why we're aggressively prosecuting cases like these, and that's why these people deserve to spend the rest of their lives in prison. Number 4. Luke Griffin a year before Luke Griffin's case, the state lawmakers of New Mexico recognized the pressing need to address the alarming frequency of fatal accidents caused by drunk drivers. They took significant steps to deter such reckless behavior by implementing harsher sentences for individuals who cause fatalities while driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs. However, the first test case under this new law resulted in what can be described as a bittersweet deal. In 2017, Luke Griffin, a student at the University of New Mexico UNM, was sentenced for causing the demise of Karina Vaden in a tragic crash. This incident occurred in February 2017 on I-25 near San Felipe when Griffin, under the influence of alcohol, recklessly rear-ended Vaden's car at a staggering speed of over 100 miles per hour. Tragically, Karina Vaden lost her life in the collision and two of her passengers suffered severe injuries. Given the severity of the offense, Griffin faced the possibility of up to 21 years in prison. 
However, through a plea agreement, his sentence was reduced to only 9 years and with good behavior, he may serve even less time, being eligible for release in half of that period. The reduction in sentencing was influenced by the fact that deadly DUI crashes were considered as non-violent crimes under the legal framework at the time. The decision to offer Griffin a plea agreement might have been influenced by the absence of mandatory sentencing guidelines for vehicular homicide in New Mexico. Barbara Romo, the deputy district attorney for Sandoval County, explained that this plea agreement was the most viable option to ensure some form of prison time for Griffin. Romo emphasized that as a prosecutor, she had to consider the potential outcomes of a trial and make decisions based on what she believed to be the best and most certain resolution for the case. Drivers who kill people, but one of the first test cases under that new law just got a pretty sweet deal. Well, Kim, UNM student Luke Griffin was sentenced here this afternoon for killing a woman in a crash. Now he was. I am extremely sorry for my actions. There's no words that I can say that will bring anyone back or will use them. New Mexico needs to be a leader as it relates to DWI, and we need to send a strong message across the board that DWI been monitored by GPS while out on bond, but court documents show he didn't behave as for sure outcome, given what I know and what I know that could happen at trial. In 2016, the state of New Mexico had taken significant steps to address the issue of DWI vehicular homicides by passing a new law that increased the penalties from a minimum of 6 years to a minimum of 15 years behind bars. Despite this legislative action, the circumstances surrounding Griffin's case allowed for a reduced sentence, which left some members of the community feeling disheartened and concerned about the potential implications for future cases. Moreover, during the time between his sentencing and trial, Griffin was granted bond and monitored by GPS to ensure compliance with legal restrictions. However, court documents later revealed that he did not adhere to these conditions as he tested positive for both cocaine and alcohol, further highlighting the severity of the issue at hand. The tragic case of Luke Griffin and Karina Vaden serves as a poignant reminder of the devastating consequences of drunk driving. It also sheds light on the complexities and challenges faced by lawmakers and prosecutors in seeking justice for victims and their families. He's only 18, but after what police say was a night of drinking, they say he crashed. After police say he plowed into a car with three women inside from Colorado, and witnesses on scene had a lot. Go ahead and stand up. Put on the bumper like I had you sitting. He said his father told him not to answer any questions until he had an attorney. Fernanda, back to you. She was everything to me, so it's it's been a lot. It's been a lot. It's a lot that there's every time. Griffin failed two drug tests in July and twice again in November. Number three, Aileen Alderette. A Las Vegas woman received a maximum sentence of 26 to 65 years in prison for a high-speed DUI crash that took the life of an eight-year-old boy and left his parents seriously injured. Emotions were raw during the sentencing of Eileen Alderet, 25, who caused the August 2018 crash that left Levy and Trike lifeless. Justice for Levy, for the love of Levy, was written on the shirts of family members who were in the Clark County District Courtroom and provided powerful impact statements. Alderet, the driver, was speeding at 103 miles per hour when she slammed into the family's car. She sobbed loudly throughout the sentencing. Alderette had pleaded guilty to one count of second-degree slaying and two counts of DUI for the August 31st crash at Harmon and Eastern Avenues to avoid a trial. The mom said she was so severely injured that when she awoke from her injury, she thought both her boys were safe at school. Okay. Today, a judge gave Eileen Alderette the maximum sentence of 26 to 65 years in prison. Police say she was high on pot, she was driving over 100 miles an hour, and running red lights when she hit. doesn't begin to explain what happened inside that courtroom. Now, the now convicted murderer. Uh, oh, like my mom said, the best birthday present that my brother came. We choose not to forgive her. We choose to forget her. Oh my goodness. And now you're going to be punished, and if education didn't work, perhaps the fear of God. Alderette's family was also inside that courtroom. They did not speak before the judge and appeared to be well, Alderette will be 51 years old when she's eligible for parole. Alderette's attorney asked the judge to consider that Alderette had never been in trouble with a law and didn't set out to do this intentionally. Several of Levy's family members testified and asked for the maximum sentence. 
The family asked the judge to set an example for the community because it could help save other lives. Levy's 12-year-old brother Joey sobbed and asked the judge for the maximum sentence saying that's what his brother would have wanted. And that's exactly what the judge decided to do. Alderette was also ordered to pay the family restitution of $467,000. Spend at least 26 years behind bars. The deadly crash happened in Henderson in August. Alderette- She was late for work. She couldn't <coughs> miss working. This angel, I am a native of Las Vegas. I love my city. And I am- Celebrate Levi's birthday. They say this year will be no different. Levi would have been nine years old this Saturday. Crash. The 25-year-old woman has decided to plead guilty to second-degree murder. Number two, Xavier Whitehead. The long-awaited day of reckoning has finally arrived for Xavier Whitehead, who recently faced conviction for the heinous November 2018 slayings of Derek Archie, Haley Stone, and Xavier Green. Throughout the trial, the courtroom was filled with heartache as families of the victims sobbed and mourned the loss of their young loved ones whose lives were tragically cut short. Remember, back in November, Whitehead was convicted of murdering three people, and his sentencing was today, and he asked the judge for some leniency. You don't know how to live anymore. You just learn to exist. He took care of me ever since I was a, a baby. How are we ever going to explain to these kids that they will never see their father again? He's trying to get in is because the deceased body of Derek Archie is right there in the front entry. During the trial proceedings held in November, the prosecution presented damning evidence against Whitehead. Among the most compelling pieces of evidence was home surveillance video that captured Whitehead's chilling actions of the slaughter. The footage showed him walking around with a gas can only moments before the targeted house burst into flames. The gravity of Xavier's Whitehead's actions was further underscored by his prior criminal history. Even before the trial, he had been in jail, facing charges related to arson, tampering with physical evidence, and armed burglary of a dwelling. These past offenses revealed a pattern of violence and disregard for the law, making the slaying case even more distressing and disturbing. The tragic events unfolded on November 15th when law enforcement deputies received a distress call about a fire in a mobile home located behind a residence in the Palm River Clare Mall area and discovered the bodies. All three victims had suffered upper body trauma indicating the extreme violence they had endured before succumbing to the deadly fire. Video footage from nearby cameras depicted three men exiting a car at the targeted home before the slayings occurred. Later, a man, presumed to be Xavier Whitehead, was leaving the same car and deliberately setting the mobile home ablaze, further sealing the fate of the innocent victims. The revelation of the harrowing sequence of events painted a grim picture of the heinous crimes committed by Whitehead. Ultimately, after a fair trial, justice was served as a judge handed down four consecutive life sentences. So important, the suspect's even accused of trying to intimidate an acquaintance from not identifying him in that. You're gonna mess this up. And then he goes on to stay, say, I don't need you on that, on the stand trying- Found it after the flames have been extinguished. There's a police officer here. We're told they'll be here throughout the night as they investigate- Or Whitehead will begin today. Of course, I will keep you updated on everything that happens. Back to you. Number one, Teddy Baltimore Smith. Spitting is the universal sign of disgust and it reportedly caused a fatal confrontation between motorists in Tampa in 2018. Teddy Baltimore Smith Jr., 44, was charged with second-degree slaying and the demise of Gilbert Cerna, 56. Surveillance video and witnesses helped cops piece together what happened. Newly released footage showed a dark BMW convertible and a Dodge Ram stop at a red traffic light at Florida Avenue in the Florida city. According to the Times, Cerna, who was a passenger in the truck, sped out the window at the BMW either intentionally or unintentionally. Smith, the BMW driver, got out of his car to confront the victim who remained in the vehicle. The situation escalated and Smith allegedly knifed Cerna, slaying him. As seen in the footage, after the violence, the driver of the truck, ID'd as Jeffrey Hunter, attempts to follow Smith. The ram is unsuccessful and eventually stops. Hunter told cops when he realized how injured his passenger was, he sought out medical attention which was also unsuccessful. Smith and Cerna did not know each other, but out of intense anger, Smith just knifed him. Because of you, my family and I will never share precious moments together. Nothing you receive will ever bring him back to us. His hand up on the truck holding, you know, resting with his right hand, 
He was sentenced to 28 years in prison. He has 30 days, Kelly. It didn't take the jury long to convict Smith of manslaughter. Prosecutors asked the judge to lock him up for up to 25 years. The judge gave him 28. Smith, however, had the last word. Quote, you gave me 28 years? Smith cried out as he was taken away in handcuffs. And that's all for today, folks. We'll see you next time at the next one.